Welcome to Praise, Prayer and Preaching with the Rev. Dr. Keith Garner. A prayer together. Lord, we pray that you would speak to us through your word as you inspired it. So inspire us to hear its truth and apply it in our lives today to the praise of Christ. Amen. Welcome to the Wesley Theatre in Sydney as we thank God for the life of one who throughout her life sought to serve God and others. Our remembrance of Shirley Dunbar has caused me to look again at the nature of Christian service. And I want to explore some of those thoughts with you for just a few moments tonight. It's been said that there are some people who live from one year's end to the other, who never do an hour of unpaid service for anyone. They'll protest that they don't do anyone any harm, but neither did they do anybody any particular good either. I suspect if we went out onto the streets of Sydney and asked folks what the Christian faith is all about, even some people who have very little connection at all with the Christian community, would, it wouldn't be long before somebody would use the word service because they would know somehow that the Christian faith and service are inextricably bound together in a very real and meaningful way. Something to do with serving others, they might say. And the concept of service is acknowledged by the majority of Christian people and many beyond the Christian community. I joined the service club Rotary 18 years ago in Wales because I was attracted particularly to the maxim of service before self. The words of Leo Tolstoy uh, will resonate with the hearts of many people as perhaps both in and outside of the Christian world as one of the uh, uh, important and significant definitions. He once said this, the simplest and shortest ethical precept is to be served as little as possible and to serve others as much as possible. Christian service is, of course, an important theme for all of us. If asked to designate uh, one thing that characterizes something of the mood of our, our generation and some of the things that seem to move against this ethos uh, of service, I think I'd agree with Maxie Dunham, who suggested that this has been a time of aggressive self-expression. People even go on courses, attend seminars and workshops and learn how to be assertive. I understand the thought behind that. I have from time to time encouraged a number of people to, to explore that area because it's important for them. But of course, there needs to be something that points us to the real nature of service. And so much of that sits in stark contrast to the way of Jesus that we discover in the Gospels. And our text is from Mark chapter 10 and verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Our own Judith Durham will be identified by many songs, but one that any of us have ever seen, a concert of hers that she frequently does sing, The Colors of My Life. If I were to look at Jesus and I were to try to, to, to paint a picture of him or at least to discover what are the primary colors in the life and ministry of Jesus, I think service is a deep dye primary color, something that you can't eradicate if you're going to have a true and meaningful and real perspective on the ministry of Jesus Christ. For Jesus isn't something he merely taught other people to do. It is something he displayed. Hidden in all our conversation about service is the paradox of the Christian gospel. When you read the gospels, you, you meet from time to time these paradoxes that bring you into contact with some deep, meaningful, and profound truths. You know, those kind of things that the last shall be first. The humble are exalted. The poor in spirit will embrace the riches of God's presence. You could consider the beatitudes, the beatitudes, the way that we might live that we find in the fifth uh, chapter of, of Matthew's gospel. And we could, we could uh, find ourselves exploring those words. And we see how in those words, Jesus turns on its head the economy of the way people think about priorities and understanding. We see the economy of God's kingdom, which is so very different. And we see it in the life of Jesus. Allow me tonight to make what I hope are three succinct points about service. 
that I hope will enable us all to reflect upon it, and then in doing so, see it in the context of the ministry of Jesus and perhaps in the lives that we all seek to live through his grace. There used to be a slogan years ago that said, saved to serve. Still has some validity. We're not saved by service, but we are certainly saved to it. It is something that ought to be seen in all our lives. Will Sangster was very direct when he said this. Indeed, it may be doubted whether we've been saved at all if we have no impulse to serve. It is a natural consequence of what it means to belong to Christ, to see through the grace of the Holy Spirit that life poured out in service toward others in and among a broken world. The service flows from the deep parts of our lives, the subterranean channels of our lives where God's work is real. And from those places, a life of service flows. This service demands no reward, save to know that we do God's will, as the old prayer said. And service brings huge, unsought satisfaction. I think a Christian view of the world can be summed up by saying the immediate payment for service may not be great, but be sure the retirement plan is out of this world. What, what life is about when you put it in the perspective of eternity makes sense for our Christian service. We don't do it to be recognized by others. We don't do it to be able to say, I did this and I did that. We do it because there is no greater will and uh, purpose in all the world than knowing that we do God's will. And things then take on a different shape. So the first of these things, service, is the measure of a person's life. You remember in Matthew's gospel, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Now these words need to be handled very carefully. In fact, there's a danger of modeling servanthood in relation to calling others to account. Jesus' instruction to the disciples strikes a very clear and marked difference between the way the disciples understood their own leadership and Jesus' own specific, clear, unique, and decisive understanding of leadership. The passage comes from a mother's request of Jesus concerning her twin sons. When she asks a favor of Jesus... I like it when people are asking favors of Jesus because when you really get and you, you, you search the scriptures and you unpack it, you say, they're asking a favor. If we listen carefully, we'll hear something that they didn't even imagine they were going to hear. So they asked the, the favor. The request was for special seating. Oh gosh, isn't special seating a problem? Don't people like special seats? And when it came to, to Jesus, they wanted special seating. When he came into his kingdom, could there be anything better than that? James and John came with their mother. I think Tom Wright, uh, Bishop Tom Wright is correct when he says it might well have been their idea all along. Come on, mum, you go and answer the question. Probably knowing that they knew enough about him that they weren't going to ask the question. The request opens a window on the whole world view of discipleship. But Jesus' curious answer slides open another window which will forever define the nature of servanthood. A book that has always sat on my desk in one form or another, though I did receive a, a new copy just a few years ago, is The Imitation of Christ by Thomas a. Kempis. It's a constant inspiration. And I can understand how, uh, along with other books, uh, Jeremy Taylor's and others, it had great influence on John Wesley. It's without doubt a religious classic, though it comes, of course, from uh, the 15th century and written in Latin with Dutch roots as well in context. It still has so much to say to us today. Its main characteristic is somehow that it's an exploration into the interior world of a person's life but with a profound outward expression. And I find that helpful when thinking about service. What is clear is when we focus on Jesus Christ, it becomes not only a journey of self-explanation and exploration, but it's the cause, it's the impetus, it's the power towards a new and dynamic way of living life. It doesn't surprise me that one of the most endearing outcomes of any life touched by the presence of Christ is an awakening of a desire to serve. 
Albert Schweitzer, once said, I don't know what your destiny will be, but one thing I do know, that the only ones among you who will be really happy are those who've sought and found a way to service. The only ones among you, not the ones who can say I've had a great career, have a marvelous record, the only ones who will ultimately be happy are those who found a way to serve. Consider how you measure the importance of a person's life. Is it by the length of a person's days and years, the longevity of their life? Is it an accumulated record of their achievements? Is it their recognition by peers and friends? Now, all those things are not insignificant. We don't rub them out somehow uh, as though it were part of some divine blackboard that is suddenly eradicated as insignificant. But our response to God and the way of service far, far exceeds any of those things. Secondly, Jesus Christ demonstrates service. John's Gospel, the 13th chapter, we shall think of this in just uh, two weeks' time. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. In Jesus' discipleship encounters, there is nowhere a clearer exemplification of what service means than in the actions of Jesus. When he washed the disciples' travel soiled feet. There was a demonstration through example of what it means to talk about the life of service. There's a powerful message in the life of such service and all of us can be recipients. 1996, Harper Business published a story of a room waiter at a Marriott hotel who learned that one of the guests in the hotel had just heard the news that her sister had died. The waiter named Charles bought a sympathy card, had the hotel staff members all sign it, and delivered it to the distressed guest with a piece of hot apple pie. Mr. Marriott, the guest later wrote, with all innocence, of course, to the president of Marriott Hotels, I'll never meet you, and I don't need to meet you, because I met Charles. I know what you stand for, and I want to assure you that as long as I live, I'll stay at your hotels, and I'll tell my friends to stay at your hotels too. Now, of course, it has its business application, but there's a powerful message in it that all of us trying to discern the, 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 what it means to discover this way of Christian service from the ministry of Jesus, from the truth of the scriptures. He wanted to understand there's a powerful message there. You see, the outcome of Christian service becomes infectious. It's something that lives at the very, in the very fibers of our life so that people can, can catch it. What Jesus did in that upper room when he washed the disciples' feet, will to me always be the starting point of any serious exploration about service. In the coming weeks, as we move towards Holy Week and Easter, we see the outworking and the life of service and the ministry of Jesus that comes to a climax in the events of the cross. He lays down his life for us. He is not murdered, though one or two hymns make the mistake of saying so. He lays down his life. It is fundamentally different. He gives us that understanding of service that that begins in Jesus himself. And thirdly, Christian service turns values upside down. 22nd chapter of Luke, verses 26 through 27. The greatest among you should be like the youngest. And the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is the greater, the one who's at the table or the one who serves? It is not the one who is at the table, but I am among you as one who serves. You see, in the context of Luke's gospel, it's interesting for me that these words come in the context of the the words of institution of the Lord's Supper. 
where Jesus has taken bread and wine and made them forever of huge significance for the Christian community. We're told that a dispute arose amongst them about who was to be considered the greatest. It's most interesting that in the ministry of Jesus, there is little by way of extended teaching about humility. Don't you think that's interesting? If in some way, humility and service are at the core of the gospel, why don't we find extended teaching about it? He taught about many other things. We don't find passages and narrative that address those things. Why? Because he showed us. Service is not first and last, uh, some kind of doctrinal uh, point. It is not a, a part of the, the ethic that we live out. It is part of what it means to live. Therefore, becomes our service and our ethic as we watch him. He had stories, upside down stories. You know how often the parables uh, that Jeremiah talked about, you should look for the one real message. Joachim Jeremiah said we shouldn't be looking for secret messages. Look for the one message in the parable that hits you between the eyes, that makes you sit up. And again and again, he turns things upside down. And about service, he did that many, many times. He invited people to a new way. Edward Schweitzer, the great Swiss New Testament scholar, observed this. Nothing is said about humility in the abstract. Jesus exhibits the attitude required of disciples in active service. He doesn't talk about a virtue, but points to something that he does. Those who live in the way of Jesus Christ automatically enter the orbit of service. For this, in a huge measure, helps to define how we see the world and how we see our part living and playing our part in that world. The contribution that God calls us to. You see, Christ lives in the heart by faith. Galatians 2 uh, and, and, and verse 20. Lives in the heart by faith in the Son of God who gave himself for me living in our hearts, enthroned part and parcel of our lives. But the vision of all things, that truth that Paul elsewhere to the Philippians wrote about, I can do all things through Christ who or which strengthens me. Christian commitment doesn't make us automatically perfect any more than it makes us geniuses. But it does quicken every aspect of our lives. I find that helpful. I'm glad it doesn't make us all geniuses. Because if it did, I didn't get it. And neither did you. But thank God, because somehow the Holy Spirit is part and parcel of our lives, there's not a part of our lives that can't be quickened and brought to life in a new and wonderful way. You see, we view the world uh, uncluttered by self-interest once we begin to grasp that life in Christ. So Michael Costa, the celebrated uh, conductor, was holding a rehearsal. And while he was uh, rehearsing, the wonderful sound that, that, that rang out, accompanied by scores of different instruments, the piccolo player, little pint-sized flute, thinking of perhaps his contribution would not be needed, and perhaps he was going for a coffee, slipped out. Suddenly, the great leader stopped the orchestra, tapped the baton in that way that the conductor uh, can do, said, where is the piccolo? You see, the sound of that small instrument was necessary for the harmony. And Costa missed it once it was dropped out. I hope the point needs no exposition. Sometimes the smallest and seemingly insignificant part that a person plays makes a big difference to the whole. And once you decide you're not playing with the rest of the orchestra, for whatever reason it is, you rob the whole of its sound. And, and I believe that the call to Christian service has a great deal to say, for he is our conductor. If in our Christian service, players and instruments of diverse size, shape, note, and character are there, 
and the piccolo thinks it's time for a latte, then the orchestra is robbed. Maybe I'm speaking to many piccolo players this evening. You think that uh, your contribution doesn't matter. Your personal angst has got to be right up there so you're not playing with the rest of the orchestra. Start to play with the orchestra again. For the music requires it. And the call to Christian service is that call to believe somehow that the contribution of all does actually matter. Sometimes you may feel convinced that your contribution, to use an Americanism, doesn't make a hill of beans in the bigger scheme of things. Maybe you've buried your talent in the ground to use another Jesus parable story. Richard Loving, blowing your horn, concludes, for those who won't play, or at least aren't playing, Jesus has something to say. This evening, we've considered something of the nature of servanthood. And I hope you've journeyed with me long enough to know that servanthood is part and parcel of the ministry and work of Christ himself. And when it is seen in our lives, it is Christ who is seen. And the Christ who is seen makes a difference to the world in which our witness must be powerful. Perhaps some words I noted many years ago will offer a challenge to each of us. There are two great divisions amongst religious people. Those who serve God legally and those who serve him lovingly. You can never make a servant out of legality. You can never bring a pile of rules and say that's what's necessary or you will produce the kind of servanthood which is an abomination and that which is the slavery that, thank God, we've tried to remove from the squirt of the earth. But lovingly, when we embrace the gift of Christ in our lives, when we welcome him into our lives, then a new perspective is possible for us. We see the whole world in a different way. And lovingly, we can discover the power of servanthood. And finally, there is no greater privilege in all the world than serving God. Tonight in our service here in the theater, we remembered the life of someone who served God for many, many years. There is no privilege that is greater than that. And don't waste any time if you haven't started the life of service. Start it now. Reach out to Christ. Invite him in. Commit yourself to be his servant today. And in doing so, you'll find the greatest joy in all the world. We don't rejoice because we've achieved much. We don't rejoice because we have seen much. But we do rejoice that God, our loving Heavenly Father, has revealed his grace in Jesus Christ. And we took up the baton in our day to a life of service. A prayer. Living Lord, as you have called us to this life of service, we pray that you would give us the power of your spirit to live it out day by day in such a way that men and women, young people and boys and girls may see Christ in our lives and in his joy. <laughs>